wounded and bleeding, dying for me. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And Paul says that's the gospel by which we are saved. It's not complex. It's not complicated. It's not 45 steps to a better life. It's the good news that Christ came into the world to save sinners and, as Paul says, of whom I am chief. How thankful we are that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now we're on part five today of the covenant and the land. The promises that God gave to Abraham concerning the land that we know today as Israel, and a great deal more land than that, a very extensive land going all the way up into what originally was the Hittite Empire up in Turkey, all the way over to the Euphrates River, all the way down south to the Nile River, the Arabian Peninsula. All of that is ultimately part of the landed covenant that God has given to national Israel. We saw that covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 14, uh, and that's the covenant that we're studying in six parts. There will be one more message on this next week. That covenant set the conditions by which national Israel entered the promised land. It set the conditions by which they get to remain in the land. And when they don't follow those conditions, they are expelled from the land. It set the conditions necessary to ultimately inherit the entire scope of the land. It says that the land is an everlasting possession. This is not a temporary covenant. It is a covenant that is interrupted by Israel's sin, but it is an everlasting covenant. It guarantees that when Israel is expelled because of their sin, that God will ultimately bring them all back to the land, and that is going to occur during the millennium. We'll see a few more passages today, brand new passages that we've not studied yet, which talk about the timing of that, which talk about the extent of that, and the means that God is going to use to draw them back to the land of Israel. And then finally, it guarantees that God will bring them back because God says that his covenants with Israel cannot be broken. Rather significant passages that we'll be dealing with concerning that. Now, when we've talked about the covenant of the land, we learned that there are three undergirding principles that relate to that covenant. First, it's a prophetic covenant. Second, since God always fulfills prophecy literally and naturally, and visibly and specifically we can be guaranteed that this falls under the way in which God fulfills his prophetic promises and because future promises to Israel are prophetic denial of a literal interpretation is really a denial of scripture and an attack on inspiration some very serious issues that are uh, related to this now last week we added some new material that there are seven basic features the prophecy related to national Israel. First of all, that Israel would be a nation forever. That's an unconditional promise. And uh, we saw that in Genesis 17, 7 and 8, where the uh, smoking lamp passed between the pieces when God cut his covenant with Abraham. We saw it in Romans chapter 11. And we're going to be spending some time today in Romans chapter 11 because what God does with Israel is given as a visible graphic picture for us, an illustration of how God deals with us as his elect. Romans chapter 11 is a very, very critical passage in understanding why national physical Israel is so important to the church because God gives symbols in the Old Testament. He gives illustrations in the Old Testament to teach us some New Testament principles. And Romans 11 deals with national Israel in great detail so that we will know that the promises that God made to us will be fulfilled literally just like the promises God made to Israel are also going to be fulfilled literally. Some very important parallels. We'll get to that in a moment. But uh, I wanted to read you the first five verses out of uh, Genesis, uh, excuse me, Romans chapter 11, where Paul makes it very clear that God still has a plan for national Israel. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. He's not allegorizing things here. He is making some very clear definitive statements concerning his national physical heritage. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye know what the scripture saith of Elias, how he make an intercession to God against Israel. He didn't make intercession against the church, he made intercession against Israel. 
makes intercession against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is also a remnant. Now, who's he been talking about? He's been talking about national Israel. There is a remnant according to the election of grace. And that is the key verse that takes us into the rest of this chapter that shows why God's promises to Israel, Israel is called an elect nation. The angels that did not fall are called elect angels. Christ is called the elect of God. The church has individuals who are elect. You have to see the context. Here the context is national Israel. And he's going to use national Israel and the election of Israel as a nation to show us how God keeps his promises to those who are his elect. That's us today. Those who have trusted Christ as their savior. And so if God doesn't keep his promises literally to Israel, how can you expect God to keep his promises literally to you? Very important chapter, Romans chapter 11. And we'll be looking at more of it a little bit later on. But at the present time, Paul says, there is also a remnant according to the election of grace. God has what's called the remnant principle. You can track that all the way through the Old Testament. Even when all the rest of the nation apostatizes, God has a remnant and he always keeps his remnant. Just like he always kept someone alive in the seed of David, the line of David, who could sit on the throne, although sometimes they were not because of sin. And that's why we have the Messiah able to trace the lineage all the way back to David and all the way back to Abraham. And we find that in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. God keeps his promises. And that's why we can be sure that he will keep his promises to us as well. Second thing that we saw was it would be a land forever, the covenant of the land, ultimate fulfillment, totally unconditional, although the Jews were cast out, as you know, on various occasions, and then brought back in, and we saw many passages related to that. Genesis 15, unto thy seed have I given this land. Joshua chapter 1, verse 3, unto the land which I do give to them, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. Down in Joshua 1, 6, be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide an inheritance, the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. So uh, God is re-emphasizing after the children of Israel cross the river what land he's talking about. It's this land, the land you're going into, the land that you're going to divide for an inheritance, the land that you're going to conquer the seven nations that are in that land, and you're going to drive them out and cast them out. But we found that because Israel sinned, they would be cast out. And we have some specific prophecies related to that. You recall we looked at the book of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah prophesies exactly 70 years that the children of Israel would be carried captive into Babylon. It's in Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 11 through 13. And then we saw that fulfilled in the book of Daniel. Daniel's reading the book of Jeremiah, and he suddenly realizes, hey, we have just come toward the end of that 70-year period. So he begins to pray and fast that God will now fulfill the promise that he made which God, of course, did. We saw passages in Deuteronomy 28, how God would pluck them off the land when they sinned, and then how he would return them. And that's the promise to Israel that they will be restored to the land. We see that after Israel went down into Egypt, God said they're going to be there for 400 years. And then I'm going to bring them out with a strong arm, and that's what the book of Exodus is all about. But he promised that back in Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 14, long before Moses was ever born. Long before the children of Israel went down to Egypt. Long before the 400 years of bondage in Egypt ever took place. And God fulfilled it literally. He brought them as a nation out of the land. He formed them into a nation at the crossing of the Red Sea. We saw Deuteronomy chapter 30. When they repent, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whether the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. We saw the great prophecies concerning Christ, the one who's called the righteous branch in Jeremiah 23. And it tells us, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved. Now we're going to be talking about that in a few moments, so I'll save it till then. And Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord 
our righteousness, Jehovah Tzidkenu. The Lord, our righteousness. He prophesies in verse 7, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth which brought up the children out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries whither, they had, whither I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. I don't know how you can allegorize that away. I mean, there are those who do, many, many within the Reformed tradition, allegorize it all away and said, God's never going to keep those promises to Israel. It's all done. The church is now Israel. In two weeks, the Lord willing, I mean, talking about, is Israel the church and is the church Israel? Right now, what we're seeing is that God gave some promises to national Israel. He didn't give these promises to the church. Now, I had the privilege of living in Jerusalem for a year. But that's not a fulfillment of these promises. These promises are to a nation, a nation that's related physically to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Ezekiel 37, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall no more be two nations. Remember, uh, during the days of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, the nation was divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom was called Israel, and the southern kingdom was called Judah. And there are all kinds of wars. And as you read First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings, you see what's going on with these horrible kings. The northern kingdom, Israel, had no good kings, not even one. The southern kingdom, Judah, had a few good kings, and as a result, they lasted a little longer. They didn't get conquered for another 200 years after the northern kingdom fell to Assyria in 722 BC. But the southern kingdom lasted all the way until the Babylonians came in, in 586, and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. But there's coming a day where they will be reunited under one king. Not under the Knesset, under one king is what it says here. That day has not yet happened, but it is coming. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of the transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them, so that they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Quoted in the book of Hebrews. Oh man, there's some exciting promises there. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments, and observe my statutes, and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given to my Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers dwelt. So you have no question about which land it's going to be. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children, forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Now that brings us to what we talked about, and I mentioned it just in passing last week, is repentance must come first. Repentance must come first for all of these incredible prophecies to be fulfilled. Not just individual repentances here and there, but repentance as a nation. What was the message that John the Baptist preached as he was the forerunner of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was a message of repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. He was calling national Israel to repentance. He was not calling the Romans to repentance. He was not calling the Greeks to repentance. He was not calling the Chinese to repentance. He was calling Israel, national Israel, to repentance. As you read the close of the book of Malachi, last book of the Old Testament, you see that the one who is mentioned there, and Jesus later says that he is fulfilling the mission of Elijah, is going to turn the heart of the children to the fathers and the heart of the fathers to the children before the great and notable day of the Lord. He's calling them to repentance because a time of judgment is coming. It's prophesied in the very last chapter of the Old Testament. We'll see a little more about that in a few moments, the Lord willing. But the call is a call to repentance. Because before the great 
promises concerning the ultimate fulfillment of the landed covenant can come to pass, Israel as a nation must come to repentance. That means that at the time that it repents, it must be a nation. That is why it is so exciting to see Jews gathering into the land of Israel and it becoming a nation in one day in 1948, May of 1948, becoming a nation in one day and the Jews continue to come from all over the earth. But they're not all there yet. There's going to be a day when every one of them gets pulled back to the land. We're going to see some great promises concerning that. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is hand. It must come first. Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning in verse 1. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, that is, uh, all the blessings and curses that he's talked be set before you, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whether the Lord thy God hath driven thee, which he has done three times, and twice has restored them. We're in the middle of the third recall right now. And shalt return unto the Lord thy God. That's repentance. And shalt obey his voice. Repentance is not merely saying you're sorry. It's not merely stopping dead in your tracks and not going any further. Repentance, a special word in the New Testament for repentance, metanoia, it means to turn around about face. You are heading south and you turn around and you head north. You move the other direction. You don't just sit there. Repentance is not just feeling sorry for yourself or feeling sorry about your sins or feeling sorry that you got caught in your sins. Repentance is, yes, I not only acknowledge that I was wrong, but I'm not going to do it anymore. I turn around, I head exactly the opposite direction from which I was going. That's what it's saying here. Thou shalt return unto the Lord thy God and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart. God does not want wishy-washies. God does not want flip-flap. God wants people who are committed to doing his will. Committed to doing what is right. Committed to obedience regardless of the cost. Are you committed Or are you one of those wishy-washies? Wishy-washies. And you want to know the will of God, but you're like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man, says James, think that he will receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You're not going to get any answers to prayer. You're not going to know the will of God. You're not going in the will of God. You're just going to be battering around out there like some you know, piece of driftwood floating out in the ocean that's getting flopped by the waves. Driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he should receive anything of the Lord. When you return with all your heart and with all your soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations, whether the Lord thy God has scattered thee. God's the one who scattered them because of their sin. God is the one who will draw them irresistibly when their heart gets right with him. There's coming a day when every Jew on the face of the earth is going to be saved. Paul says so. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. We'll get there in a few minutes. Zechariah 12, verse starting in verse 8. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. Can you imagine? Think of the most feeble person that you know. And then think about David. It says the feeble among them shall be as David. What will the strong ones be like? This is supernatural empowerment that's taking place here in this promise. He shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, and the angel of the Lord before them. And the angel of the Lord, as you know, is a theophany of Christ in the Old Testament. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. It's coming a day when Israel will not have the United States as its ally. It won't have anybody as its ally. It says all the nations are going to come against Jerusalem at some point in the future. Weep for your country.
There's coming a time known as the time of Jacob's trouble, also known as the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's sorrow, when Israel will experience the worst pogrom or holocaust that it has ever experienced. There will be no nation that offers refuge, no nation that offers a safe haven, no na nation that offers condolences and food and shelter. But it says, God will defend Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Oh, how I yearn to see this. The spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Who is speaking? This is Zechariah's book. This is Old Testament. But suddenly we have the first person speaking. They shall look on me, whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Back to third person. But they're going to see one who speaks here. They shall look on me, whom they have pierced. We find that that's not only in the Old Testament, but also in the Gospels and the Epistles of Paul. This time of great trouble, whereby God finally will be the one who stands up and defends Israel against all the nations of the earth. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, so the tribulation comes first. It's coming. You don't have this promise fulfilled until the tribulation comes. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. There's not going to be a long period of time after the tribulation. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. What is the sign of the Son of Man? That's the Shekinah glory, the glory cloud. Jesus referred to that in John chapter 8, where he was disputing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he said to them, Before Abraham was, I am. They took up stones to stone him. But what had he said right before that? He had been talking about how he was, in fact, God capable of forgiving sins. Before Abraham was, I am? That suddenly switches you from Abraham, 2000 BC, to Moses, 1445 BC, at the burning bush, which we've just studied in our text. God said to Moses, when Moses asked the question, Whom shall I say sent me? And God said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. That's why they took up stones to stone him. He claimed to be the one speaking from the Shekinah glory in the burning bush in the wilderness of the desert. They will see the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Remember, everything is dark. The sun has gotten squished. The moon has gotten squished. The stars have gotten squished. Total darkness. And suddenly the blaze of the Shekinah appears in the heavens as Christ begins to return to earth. And you can understand why all the tribes of the earth are going to wail and mourn when they see this. 
Now, people, either prophecy is true or it's not true. Either this is going to happen or it's not going to happen. Either this is natural, normal, literal interpretation of scripture, or we have to allegorize it away and say it's not going to happen. Every other prophecy that has ever been fulfilled has been fulfilled literally. Jesus is telling us when this will happen. It will happen after the tribulation, after that time of Jacob's trouble, after that time of Jacob's sorrow, after that time where Israel goes through this worst time of persecution that they have ever experienced in the world. Because you see, God is bringing them through the refiner's fire that he might fulfill the ultimate promise that he has given them concerning the land. All of this ties back to the landed covenant that we've been discussing. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and he, all the tribes of the earth shall mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Takes you to Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 7, where we find the throne sitter, the Ancient of Days, sitting on the throne of glory, reflected again in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 19, and then Christ establishing his kingdom. We see it in the throne room vision in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, where he gives the letter to the seven churches. Dear people, this is a major theme of scripture. Now back to Romans chapter 11. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Israel is not the church. It doesn't say blindness in part has happened to the church until the fullness of the Gentiles be coming. That would make no sense at all. Verse 26. Remember he started talking about he's a descendant of Abraham. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. He's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Look what he says in verse 26. After all of this that we've been discussing here, it says, and so all Israel not the church. And so all Israel shall be saved. There's coming a day when every Jew on the face of the earth is going to get saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is the sovereign work of God. It's not God sitting up there biting his teeth wondering when in the world they're all going to get saved at once and man, you know, we get some new ones born here and they're not saved yet and these ones are dying over here that had gotten saved and oh, when are we ever going to be able to get them all saved at once? There's so many of them. That is not a problem for God. God is the one who irresistibly draws his elect and he has a precise time in which he will rebuild Israel as a believing nation. They are in the land right now in unbelief, but they're only partly there. There are a few scattered believers among the Jews in Israel and in other parts of the world. But this is a day in which all Israel shall be saved. That's a quotation out of um, Isaiah chapter 59, verses 20 and 21. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Now that's repentance. They turn from it. From transgression. Remember we talked about repentance, the Greek New Testament word for it, methanoia, where you're going south and you turn around and you head north. 180 degrees about face. Listen to verse 21. What word stands out to you? I'll emphasize it. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed saith the Lord from henceforth and forever. Remember the remnant principle? God has a remnant, according to Romans 11.25, a remnant according to the election of grace. What magnificent promises. Do you remember what we just read in Jeremiah, that a day is coming when all Judah shall be saved? Verse 5 and 6, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. A king shall reign and prosper, shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord, our 
righteousness. And the, the very next verses here in Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 27, For this is my covenant unto them, not unto us, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. The fathers are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He's telling you, that from eternity past, God made elective choices. And through these elective choices, he guarantees that there will be certain results. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. We're called to repent, but God does not have to change his plan. Israel, I think, is a, a key illustration of election and chasing of the elect in Scripture. Just because you're elect, just because you get saved, does not mean that you won't be chastened. The book of Hebrews tells us whom the Father loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Parents spank their own children. He says if you never get spanked, it means you're illegitimate. You're not really one of the Father's children. Verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they're enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Now, they're stiff-necked people. I mean, all the way through the Old Testament, the prophets are always bemoaning the fact that Israel has such hard heart, it has such a stiff neck, it is always resisting and rebelling against the gracious goodness of God. But God has unconditional love, and you and I had better be thankful for that. Because if God didn't have unconditional love, he would have thrown all of us away a long time ago, including me, especially me. All the times that I've been stubborn and not really wanted to do what God wanted me to do because I had plans of my own. The gracious love of our gracious Heavenly Father, who in love sent his Son to die for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things, says the Apostle Paul. If he gave us that, will he not also do good for us in every other way? Paul specifically says that these things happened as an illustration so that we might learn that's why we study the Old Testament, folks, even though we're not under the law. We study the Old Testament because God shows us through Israel as an elect nation how he will deal with us as elect individuals. That's the whole point of learning the Old Testament. Let me give you some passages. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. There were no Israelites that took a, an alternate route and got there. I mean, none of them went all the way to the head of the Nile River and got on a boat and then sailed over to the coast of Israel. They weren't part of it. None of them decided to take an airplane first to China and then come back to Jerusalem. Everybody who was going to be part of the nation had to go through this process. They were all under the cloud. That's the cloud of the Shekinah glory. All passed through the sea. And all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That does not mean they got wet. Does not mean they got immersed. Does not mean they got sprinkled or poured. It means they were identified with Moses in the cloud and in the sea. It was the Egyptians who got wet. All did eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Who led Israel through the wilderness? It tells you right here. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now listen to verse 6. Many of them did get overthrown. In fact, only one in a million made it, Joshua and Caleb. Now these things were our examples. Why did all this happen to Israel in the Old Testament? Why do we have this picture of Israel as a nation in the Old Testament and the way in which God deals with Israel in the Old Testament? It tells you right here. 
Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. Why do you study Israel? Why do you study the Old Testament prophets? Why do you study Old Testament history? It's so that you might have an example of what you'd better not get into. So that you'll have an example of how God deals with his people when they get out of line. A few verses later, down in verses 11 and 12. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Verse 12. Wherefore, don't get too cocky, don't get too proud, and Paul has just told that over in Romans chapter 11, and we'll get back to Romans 11, the Lord willing, in a minute. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. If you get proud, if you think, I'm so much better than Israel ever was, look at me. I'm doing okay. You know what? You're cruising for a bruising. You are about to fall. Because you have the same old sin nature. And you have the same temptations, you have the same desires, you have the same drives that Israel did in the Old Testament. Now you have the indwelling Holy Spirit and they didn't. But how much more accountable then are you and am I when we do sin? The repentance of Israel as a nation is the principal promise that Paul appeals to in Romans 11 to prove this. Paul says that God sovereignly ordained the temporary fall of Israel so that he could open the door for Gentiles to be saved. But he didn't wipe them out entirely. He tells us specifically that it was a temporary fall of national Israel. Listen to this. Romans 11, 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. <laughs> As you read the book of Acts, you see that happening all the time. Paul goes to the Gentiles and the Jews get jealous about it. And they track him down and they stone him and they beat him and they... They do everything they can to make his ministry miserable. Paul says here, God did that so that they would be provoked to jealousy when the Messiah suddenly made salvation available to Gentiles. That's us. That's why we're here. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, think about this carefully, if the reason that Israel fell and went into the third diaspora, the third dispersion around the world, if the reason of that was so that God could bring salvation to Gentiles, which is what the book of Acts is about, if that is the case, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, we've gotten those riches, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, what do you think it's going to be like when they get restored? which is what he says next, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, that is, other Jews, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? When God draws them as a nation back to himself, in these shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. For if the first root be holy, the lump is also holy. If the root be holy, so are the branches. And then he begins to compare. Israel was a branch. You and I are a branch. If some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. Don't say, well, look how good we were. We got grafted in. They got broken off. We got grafted in. <laughs> Paul says, be careful. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. You don't give sustenance to the root. The root gives sustenance to you. 
that will say that, well, the branches were broken off, but I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, those that are directly related to the root. If God didn't spare the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. I'll let you think about that for a moment. You're in the tree as a result of faith. Unbelief can cut you off. A lot of interesting thoughts there, not loss of salvation, but that is a very serious and severe illustration of the chastening of God. And he goes on. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Israel cut off, but Israel's going to get grafted in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted in contrary to nature, into a good olive tree, how much more? How much more shall these, which be the natural branches, that's the Jews, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Know well what that passage is saying. It does not say the church has replaced Israel. It does not say that the church has become Israel. The church is merely grafted into the root. And Israel as a nation is going to be re-grafted into the same root when Israel as a nation repents. The church and Israel are two separate branches that are grafted into the same root of the Messiah. And so shall all Israel be saved. Very next verse, verse 26. So shall all Israel be saved as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Well, our time is up. I want to talk about how national repentance and salvation will come at the end of the greatest period of a chastening that Israel as a nation has ever known, that seven-year period called the Great Tribulation. And the Lord willing, we'll pick it up in the book of Hosea next week and see how long that it will take. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your great and precious promises. We thank you that you are the God of all flesh, that you gave some promises to Abraham, and you've been fulfilling them literally over the centuries. And here we find ourselves in that third cycle of Israel being drawn back to the land. Coming back in unbelief, but there's a day coming when they shall turn to the Lord, and so shall all Israel be saved. Father, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray that your word, the gospel of Christ, will have free course among these whom you love so much. These who are related by flesh and blood to our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you will help us as a people to pray for them. To think of them as those who are the natural branch that has currently been broken off, but that you have promises to regraft them again. Cause us, Father, to be consistent in our testimony. For many times we are hard-hearted and stiff-necked, just like Israel was in the Old Testament. And yet you still love us because it is an election of grace. 
not based on our works, but upon your grace. Father, we pray that you will take your word as proclaimed today, that you will use it in each of our hearts and bring glory to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 625, Son of My Soul. Let's turn to 625 and we'll stand to sing.